Americans for Prosperity North Dakota proudly supported important policy improvements that broke barriers for all North Dakotans this legislative session. From tackling unnecessary and burdensome occupational licensing standards to fighting for tax relief, AFP is proud to have played a part in improving the lives of North Dakotans this year. Join AFP today by visiting www.afpnd.org. This advertisement was paid for by Americans for Prosperity. Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast. I am your host, Rob Port. Uh, no commentary from me today, just a couple of interviews on today's episode. First, Chip Englinger, Englander, I should get that name right, uh, he is uh, the pollster behind 1892. They're the firm working for Governor Doug Burgum's campaign that released that polling information about uh, contrasting uh, Governor Doug Burgum with uh, former U.S. Senator Heidi Heitkamp ahead of the 2020 gubernatorial race. Uh, so you'll hear him talk all about that. Heidi Heitkamp, by the way, since that interview was recorded, has announced that she is definitely not running for governor, which is an interesting development. But you'll hear uh, Chip and I discuss that poll and what it means for the 2020 election cycle in North Dakota later in the show. Also, Dane DeCray, who is uh, a new the new leader for the ACLU in the state of North Dakota. We talk a little bit about what his priorities for the group are and, and some of the efforts that they're making, frankly, to reach into the into the conservative community. So that's not such a bad thing. All that coming up straight ahead. This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota. Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. Some polling was released this week by Governor Doug Burgum's re-election campaign, and it was interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, Governor Burgum hasn't announced that he's running for re-election yet, although I don't know that there are many people out there that doubt he is running for re-election. Uh, but he hasn't officially announced yet, but he is polling, which I kind of feel like is a de facto answer maybe on, on that question. Uh, also, uh, Governor Burgum chose to contrast himself was somebody who also hasn't announced a campaign of, of any kind, former U.S. Senator Heidi Heitkamp. Here to talk with me about that poll and more is Chip Englander, who is a pollster for the Republican Party, uh, his firm, 1892, right? Is that what it is, 1892? Oh, what is? Yep. By the way, what's the story behind that, 1892? I was looking it up. That's a presidential election year, but why 1892? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, 1892 is the was the a previous year that the Republican, uh, excuse me, that a well, was the last time the somebody was elected governor won the president's home state uh, of the out party until I helped elect the governor of Illinois in 2014 oh. when Obama was president. So we elected a Republican as governor in in the president's home state of the of the out party. In eighteen ninety two was the last time that it ever happened. So it's a little bit of an obscure uh, statistic. Well, I, I should I should say so. Unusual. I was googling it. And I was going to try to be smart and figure it out, but that is that is way too obscure <laughs> for me to have ever figured out on my own. All right. So the polling uh, shows good news for Governor Burgum. Uh, it shows him polling very strongly. Yep. Uh, he's got high favorables. He's uh, polling strongly against. Heidi Heitkamp. The, the polling shows him 62% versus 33% for Heidi Heitkamp. And then in terms of favorability, uh, 70% seeing Governor Burgum as favorable, uh, just 41% seeing Heitkamp as favorable. Burgum's unfavorable number at 17%. My first question is, why why Heidi Heitkamp? Why, why contrast him with her? Well, you know, she's just the best known Democrat that's out there. And obviously she's sort of she's run for office many times and so in terms of being able to sort of take stock of where uh politics are in north dakota you put putting the the best known democrat out there and what was interesting is and you touched on a little bit is just sort of how overwhelmingly popular the governor is and the fact that he would defeat really any democrat easily including uh, that overwhelming margin even against heidi What's interesting is you, you say his his because his number is high. I mean seventy seventy percent approval rating. It, it, it's such a such a 
divisive time, by the way, politically. Yes. Is pretty remarkable, um, yes. and it's it's all the more so because your your poll showed something interesting. I don't know if you saw, but but last week I was writing about some numbers from DFM Research, which is a, a another polling outfit. Uh, Dean Mitchell yep. there is a friend of mine. He shared with me some results from some of his recent polling. And by the way, he's done work for Democrats and and Heidi Heitkamp, so we're we're getting some bipartisan numbers here. And his polling showed that Governor Burgum was very popular, where I shouldn't say very popular, was more popular maybe than than you would think among Democrats. He was at 37 percent favorable, 34 percent unfavorable. So here you have a Republican governor who is, you know, has is, is above he has a plurality of Democrats saying he is uh, they, they view him favorably. Your numbers, yep. meanwhile, showed 44 percent of self-identified liberal voters viewing him favorable. I mean, both of those numbers are very, very strong for a Republican governor. Yes. No, I, I mean, I do polling all around the country, and, you, and you're and you exactly right. It's a very hyper-polarizing atmosphere where you tend to have, you know, people put their jerseys on. Republicans like the Republicans, and they don't like the Democrats, and vice versa. But Governor Burgum has really transcended that, and he's just a rock star in terms of popularity and his extraordinary breadth of appeal i mean not only is he obviously he's he's net positive with democrats and liberals as you mentioned but i mean he's strongest even with with republicans and conservatives and moderates and independents i mean whether it's right left center of the political spectrum and it's very unusual to see this sort of breadth of appeal especially in this political environment well it's got to be tough i mean if you're democrats and you're thinking okay we've got to recruit a candidate to run against doug burgum and it's somebody who's got to, you know, catch fire with enough of, of North, enough North Dakota voters to, to put them over the top in 2020. They got to be looking at the number and say, well, we're already starting with, you know, around 40 percent. Right. The DFM polls at 37 percent favorable. You're at 44 percent. We split the difference. Maybe we're around 40 percent. Forty percent of Democrats are already viewing him favorably so not only is it about well we're operating in a republican state so we've got to convince a bunch of republican voters to maybe cross the aisle and vote for a democrat but we got to convince a bunch of democrats that he's not doing mm-hmm. such a great job either which is which has got to be a tough that, that's, that's got to be looking like a steep mountain to climb for democrats right now yeah you, you stole the metaphor i was going to use it is a it is a steep mountain to climb i mean he's extraordinarily popular and and ex- exceptionally well positioned I'm not surprised by this. If you go back to uh, the June 2016 primary, which was Governor, or not Doug Burgum versus uh, Attorney General Wayne Stengem, and in the Republic, in North Dakota, the, the, the primary, the, the, the parties pick their candidates on the primary ballot. The convention's endorsed, but it really it's that June vote that selects the candidates. And when you go to the ballot, you, you have to pick which slate of candidates you're going to vote for. You're either going to vote for the help the Republicans choose their candidates or you're going to help the Democrats choose their candidates, but you can't cross once you're voting for Democrats, you got to vote on the Democrat side, not the Republican side. So what's interesting is that historically, as you might expect in a Republican state, North Dakota is about, you know, around 2 to 1 people voting on the Republican ballot versus the Democratic ballot because North Dakota is a Republican state. In the 2016 primary though, it was over five to one people voting for the Republican ticket versus the Democratic ticket. And really, the only contested race was that gubernatorial race versus Doug Burgum and Wayne Stengem, which to me has sp- spoken to, to, to Doug Burgum having a message that has transcended really party lines and has always brought a lot of mm-hmm. Democrats over into the Republican tent. Something which, by the way, I, I think I think the reason why a lot of down ballot Democrats in North Dakota, not just the statewide candidates, but a lot of the legislative races just got decimated in 2016. And I'm wondering if that sort of appeal isn't going to really hurt Democrats in 2020 as well in North Dakota. Yeah, I think I think you're exactly right. I think he is the ability to have that coattail effect that you just touched on. Um, I think we've seen that before, and I think he's very well positioned for that. Uh, I, I want to touch a little bit on Donald Trump as well. Now, you polled uh, Trump versus Biden, Joe Biden being the Democratic front runner right now. Uh, President Trump, you had him at 60 percent, 34 percent for Biden in a head to head matchup. And then Trump's favorability almost mirrors those exact numbers. He's at 60 percent favorable, 35 percent unfavorable. Uh, I, I was just reading this morning, Morning Consult, you know, kind of does these regular national polls. And they're showing that yep. President Trump has been slipping in his popularity in places like North Dakota, s- sort of the states that helped make him president. 
But you're you're still showing very very strong numbers for Donald Trump in North Dakota. Any any comment on that? Yeah, no, I, I think you 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 are seeing that he is fantastic numbers here. Obviously, he won the state uh, overwhelmingly. It was the second best state in the country in 2016, and I think he's going to win here decisively uh, again. I don't think that he's seen a lot of slippage in, in these in in sort of the Trump country states like North Dakota. Uh, I think with the economy, with how it's going, uh, you're seeing, I think nationally, you're seeing his numbers pick up a bit. Uh, although I think, you know, it'll obviously prove to be a competitive race. Well, there's always a lot of factors too. I mean, it's, it's a lot of it's going to yep. depend. I, I, I think the way I, I don't, a 60% favorability doesn't surprise me for Trump. He got over 75% of the vote in 2016 in North Dakota. I think, I think sort of the, the difference between those two numbers has a lot to do with people just really, really not liking Hillary Clinton in North Dakota. And that's going to be true in 2020. It's not just going to be a referendum on Trump standing alone on the ballot. He's going to be contrasted with another candidate. Uh, that's going to factor in. And the fact that he's an incumbent. And anytime you have an incumbent, he's actually been governing for a little while and people are going to have some uh, some feelings about that. Chip, I know I didn't have a lot of time with you. Any final thoughts on this? No, I think just that the the numbers are breathtaking. He's been the governor's been incredibly accomplished and voters appreciate that from all sides of the political spectrum. Yeah, and you know, we were talking about his cross democratic appeal. I've I've maintained Governor Burgum for the most part, you know, I could quibble here and there and um, nobody's perfect <laughs> in the eyes of anybody else, but uh he I, he's got, he's done this. He's appealed to Democrats while governing as largely as a conservative. And I really think that's something for Republicans to look at and emulate. Chip, thanks for your time. Yep. Thank you. by the name of Dane DeCray joins me now. Uh, he was recently announced as advocacy director for the ACLU of North Dakota. Mr. DeCray, how are you? I'm doing well. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you for uh, coming on. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. How did, how did you come to uh, be working in North Dakota? Yeah, so my family is from North Dakota. Uh, I was actually born in Wyoming, uh, but my parents are from the Valley City area. And so my parents are teachers. So every summer we came back and spent most of the summer in Valley City with my family there. And so I sort of kind of had a dual upbringing in Wyoming and North Dakota. And with all of my family here, I sort of have gravitated back to the state numerous times. I came back for my undergraduate studies at the University of North Dakota. And then I went down to law school at the University of Minnesota. But a couple of years after practicing there, I moved back to the Fargo area and I worked here as a federal public defender for a number of years. And then this job came open and I applied for it and I recently got it. I, um, it's, it's been, uh, it's been interesting to watch over the years that the ACLU's involvement in North Dakota. My my per, my perception, I guess, as somebody who, you know, has been working, I've been writing about politics in North Dakota for sixteen years. Um, the ACLU doesn't seem very hasn't seemed very active in North Dakota in, in the past. Is that fair, or is that just a a false impression? And I, and I don't mean that. I'm not trying to be critical or anything like that. It just I I will, I don't know that I would describe the ACLU as as really being that much of a presence in North Dakota in at least in in recent years is is that fair do you think uh you know i think that's a fair conversation to have rob i know that recently we didn't have an actual physical presence in the state but you know we are part of a three state chapter with both south dakota and wyoming so i know that folks out of those two states were helping doing the work in north dakota but i do think um, the fact that they recently hired me 
someone who's from North Dakota and who hasn't been doing politics for 16 years like you, but does know the state pretty well and has been here for a substantial amount of time. I think that's an indication that we're trying to do more and to do better and to make a long-term commitment to North Dakota because my family's here, my wife and my son, my grandparents, my cousins, my aunts and uncles. And so I am here for the long haul in North Dakota, and I'm hopefully trying to send that message to other people and just to the um, ACLU uh, as a whole that we're here and we're ready to do more work for the people of North Dakota. Are you are you dedicated? I mean, you, you said you're, you're part of a three state chapter, but you specifically, I mean, are you dedicated to working in North Dakota? I mean, I understand it sometimes I guess maybe you'll help out in other states, but I mean, is that your primary focus in the within the ACLU is North Dakota? Absolutely. Um, I am in the process of opening an office in Fargo, but I also don't want the misconception to be that it's going to be an eastern side organization. I'm going to be coming out west regularly. I'm going to Bismarck next week, for example, to meet with a number of people. I'm going to try to get to all of the reservations and meet with tribal leaders and stakeholders. But yes, the vast majority of my work is going to be focused on North Dakota. And obviously, like you said, with a three-state chapter, I'm sure I will dabble in Wyoming and South Dakota, um, obviously because I'm from Wyoming originally, so I may have some insight and help there. But my work is going to be in North Dakota. I don't know how familiar you are with with my work. I'm generally conservative, generally supportive of Republicans. I, I have a very wide libertarian streak and I admire the ACLU in many ways, which which may sound odd coming these days from some, you know self described I guess conservative. Um, but I, I look back, you know, throughout time when the ACLU, what it has done on free speech issues, I think is a big area for me that's very important. Obviously, I exercise my free speech rights for a living, uh, so those are very important to me. But I, I, there's a perception out there that the ACLU is left wing. And I look at the ACLU's policy agenda these days, and you guys really don't do a lot to appeal to conservatives. And I know your response to probably as well, we don't. You know, we're not a partisan organization and it's not our job to appeal conservatives. We're just out doing what's right. But I, that, I, that's that been a criticism I've heard from a lot of people, including past supporters of the ACLU, which is that this has become an organization that is very ideological and has maybe abandoned, you know, some of its more broader broader support for, for things like like the First Amendment. I, I know you're going to disagree with me for that, but there's a lot of skepticism for your organization among conservatives. You are now going to work in a deeply, deeply Republican state. Or, I mean, I mean how, how, do you, how do you cross that bridge? I mean, are you concerned about outreach to, to people who are on the, ideologically on the right side of politics? You know, I think that's a fair question, Rob. Um, I will say there's some parts of the premise of your question that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, what I think that our main focus is on civil rights and civil liberties. And sometimes that takes the shape of what some people call liberal. And sometimes that takes the shape of what some people call conservative. Um, I don't think our organization is one or the other. I think we work across the political spectrum, depending on the issue. I can list a number of issues that I would say people would think that was a conservative position and others where they th would think that's a more liberal position. Um, I'm definitely aware of the perception of the ACLU in conservative states. But what I'm trying to focus on is places where we can find agreement on work related to civil rights and civil liberties. And I heard from your question, um, I really appreciate your libertarian streak, Rob, actually. And there's lots of stuff that I see on your blog that uh, I think that the ACLU does support. I know that civil asset forfeiture is an issue that you've talked about. That's something that we're interested in. I also think broader issues related to criminal justice reform and the First Amendment and free speech are also things that you've written about. And so, you know, it's easy for us to look at the things that um, differentiate us, but what I'm trying to do in North Dakota to make it better for 
all of our citizens is to try to find common areas sure. with Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, anybody who wants to get to work on the types of issues that we think are important. And those are basically us trying to protect the principles of the Bill of Rights for all of the people of North Dakota. One, I, I, when in the premise of my question, I suspect that I would, what I said was that the ACLU has, has at times seemed to have sort of abandoned some of their past dedication to the First Amendment. For instance, one one issue I've had with the ACLU of late has become in, in the area of free speech, and particularly as we as we struggle with social media and how that's fitting into our into the fabric of our society and how we communicate with one another. And I, I realize it's it's not a it's not an easy thing, but the ACLU, for instance, is very supportive and very active in the areas like, you know, fighting for LGBTQ rights, which, which by, by the way, generally I, I am supportive of, um, but has, has crossed the line into saying, you know, being almost supportive of, I, 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 it's, it's hard to use a word like censor because we're talking about private companies, but, you know, platforms like Facebook and Twitter have become so ubiquitous and the ACLU doesn't seem to be doing, you know, very concerned about standing up, if, if not the legal reality of the First Amendment, but the, the spirit of the First Amendment. I mean, it se- at times it seems like the ACLU has been more protective of people not being insulted or, 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 or you know, belittled or, or you know, exposed to, to, you know, ugly language than they are supportive of the First Amendment, which is surprising for an organization that once defended the right of the Ku Klux Klan to hold a to hold a march to hold a parade, I think it was right the the famous Skokie, Illinois, um, situation. So, uh, could you speak to that a little bit? I mean, am I all wet here in, in my perception? Um, you know, I honestly am kind of confused by your question. I, okay. I guess are you asking what our position is with respect to people speaking against LGBTQ rights on Facebook, or I guess, yeah. I apologize if I'm misunderstanding, but if you can give me a little more clarity, I'd, that'd help. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's essentially, it, it, yeah. I mean, I mean, if, if somebody, if somebody wants to go on Facebook and say, I don't think homosexuals should be, should, should be able to get married or, uh, or for instance, the, the cake baker case out of Colorado, where somebody says, uh, you know, I, I don't want to bake a cake for a homosexual wedding. You know, wh- where is the ACLU's commitment to, to people's right to say no and, and to express unpopular points of view? Well, I think there's a line somewhere that we have to draw there, Rob, yeah. um, between people's free speech rights and people's speech that infringes on other people's equal rights. And so I think at least specifically to the cake baker case, um, I think that's a situation where the question was whether or not that was equal protection under the law to allow an individual to treat someone differently based on their sexual orientation. Yeah. And that kind of gets to different rights. I mean, there's always going to be a tension between free speech and equal protection under the law. And they're difficult questions. You know, that's why it ended up at the Supreme Court. That's why we had a, a split opinion. And so I think with the ACLU, there are times where we have to take positions that, um, you know, there's rights that are in conflict. And that was before I got here. And that's not, sure. you know, didn't happen in North Dakota. But I can say that I, my, they made the decision to um, take the position they did. And, you know, I'm just going to kind of try to loop back to, we're going to do our best to fight for free speech rights in North Dakota. Mm-hmm. We're going to do our best to fight for equal rights in North Dakota. But, you know, these are always hard discussions when the questions and cases are on the margins. I mean, if they were easy questions, you know, we wouldn't have, be having these discussions. Well, right. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't need, a, if, if, all, if it was all easy speech, we wouldn't need the First Amendment either, right? I mean, we don't, right. uh, what's, what's the famous say? We don't need the First Amendment to protect us talking about the weather. Um, you know, we need it when somebody says something that really makes somebody else angry. That's when we need the first amendment. So, so tell me, let's, let's get specific about North Dakota. What are the priorities for the ACLU in North Dakota? Well, I have to confess to you, Rob, I've only been on the job for about a month. Okay. And as you probably maybe have seen on our website, 
what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to go out and have conversations with people from North Dakota, all over the state, all across the political spectrum, elected officials, unelected officials, anybody who wants to sit down and talk to try to figure out exactly what North Dakota wants. Because in my old job, I really stayed away from kind of politics and kind of the issues of North Dakota because I was kind of prohibited to do so as a federal attorney. But now I'm trying to kind of tap back into the pulse of North Dakota. So there's some broad things that, you know, I have noticed in my personal life or I've heard about just as a citizen of North Dakota that I think I'm interested in looking at, but I want to kind of come in with a blank easel or a blank slate, and I want North Dakotans to tell me the things that they want to happen or that they see as problems or not problems before I you know, sit down and make some sort of a pronouncement of these are my exact goals for North Dakota. Are, are you planning a more proactive approach? In, in the past, it seems like most of what the ACLU in, has done in North Dakota is just sort of you know, like like the legislature will do something and the ACLU will either be supportive of it or or not supportive of it one way or the other. So, I mean, is it, are, are you planning on getting going beyond that? That's a great question, and it's a great segue for me. So okay. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yes, um, that has really been the new focus, I would say, of the ACLU. When I came in, that was one of the first things they talked about was this proactive versus reactive approach. And generally speaking, you're right. I think the ACLU historically is known to be reactive. When something happens uh, that we disagree with, we spring into action and everybody thinks, are you going to sue? Are you going to sue? I mean, I hear that all the time in just the one month that I've had this job. And there's a, always a place for that. And it's always going to be a part of what the ACLU does. But they've changed their focus and thinking a bit to try to be more proactive on the front end. And so using that same example, instead of waiting for the bad thing to happen, um, we are going to work to advocate against it or work to try to pass something different or stop something from happening. Um, and if that doesn't work, you always can fall back on the traditional reactive litigation sure. approach. But we just found ourselves really doing only 50% of our capacity. And yeah. so I think that's kind of why they changed the position's name to advocacy director. Yeah. Because I think it's kind of a signal that, one, we are going to be more proactive. And two, um, we are still going to fill that traditional role that I think the John Q. citizen knows when they hear the ACLU. I, I, I'm actually really glad to hear that. And I may not be supportive of all the positions that the ACLU is going to take down at the legislative session or the, you know, the amendments you may be proposing or what have you. But I like that approach better than I like lawsuits. And I'll tell you this because I, I feel like, I feel like the democratic process by which I mean, you know, we elect representatives and they go to, they go to Bismarck and they legislate and they make policy and the governor signs on that whole process, I think leads to more Pacific outcomes than, the judicial process where, you know, it's, it's really just sort of a judge judges making decisions, judges and juries making decisions. And I don't, I don't know that that's, I, I feel like people can be more accepting of things of laws, maybe that they don't like if they feel like there was a fair process. Like we had a debate at the legislature, we lost the debate. We don't necessarily like the outcome, but we had our say. And I, I'm not sure that lawsuits provide that. And I think that's an important part of, of democracy and, and getting outcomes that people are accepting of. I look at, at abortion, for instance, and obviously the ACLU has a position on abortion, but I look at that, the fact that that was settled in the courts and not the legislatures, I think has contributed to the fact that that has been, to this day, is one of the most acrimonious points of, of debate in, in this nation's history. So if we could, if we could solve more political problems in the Democrat, and I, I'm saying this realizing the times that we're living in. So I sound like, I sound like Pollyanna <laughs> here. Um, so I, but I, I think if we could, I think if we could solve it in the democratic process, I, I think people could be more accepting of it and move on from these issues than, than maybe if we do them through the courts. Yeah. And I think that is a fair position to take generally, Rob. Um, I do agree with you that there is, usually more buy-in when people feel like their voices have been heard, that they've been talked to, 
they've been asked and they've had a chance to participate. But, you know, I also am mindful that there is always the risk of the tyranny of the majority, which is also a check and balance in our system, which sure. I'm sure you know about and heard about. Sure. So, you know, I, I am always cautious to push too far on either end, yeah. because if we have a situation where a legislature, for example, doesn't want to allow African-American people to vote and we can get that passed through the legislative sure. system, Absolutely. I think everyone yeah. would agree that we probably don't want to do that. So, right. you know, I, I take your point on the abortion issue. Um, we're going to have a difference in opinion on sure. that, obviously. But I think there are the vast majority of the time, I agree that the democratic process is the way to go with, as always, there's sometimes things on the outliers that, you know, we have to debate sure. about and are always going to be tough situations. Sure, sure. And I, 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 I completely agree with you on that. Uh, let's uh, let's talk about something specific. ACLU opposed Measure 1, Ethics Commission, called it unconstitutional. We now see Measure 1 being implemented in North Dakota. Uh, the governor, in fact, just, just this week appointing members to the new Ethics Commission. Is the ACLU planning? I mean, you, you said everybody's been asking you if you're going to sue. So I'm going to now ask you if you're going to sue. Is the ACLU <laughs> planning any action on that? We're going to wait and see how things shake out. Um, you know, it's kind of early to have any sort of an idea of what's going to happen. But I do think it's extremely important for, for me to tell you and for your listeners to hear that we did not and we still do not oppose the creation of an ethics commission right. in North Dakota. Right. We had some issues with the language related to measure one. Sure. But generally speaking, we think that's a good idea to have an ethics commission. I'm glad to see that the names have been put forward. But as yeah. far as anything beyond that, we're just going to kind of do a wait and see approach. Okay. Uh, well, Dane, I appreciate your time, certainly. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking again as, as you uh, get settled into your job and issues spring up. And uh, we'll certainly have you on again. Rob, I appreciate it. That's it for today's Plain Talk podcast. Remember, you can reach me anytime, Rob at SayAnythingBlog.com, if you've got any feedback on the show. Also, follow me on social media. I'm at Rob Port on Twitter. Uh, for Search for Say Anything Blog on Twitter or Facebook. Search for Rob Port on Facebook. You'll find me. I'm pretty easy to find. If you're listening to this podcast on a platform that allows you to rate or review it, I would appreciate it if you would leave an honest rating and review. Each new rating and review helps other people find the podcast. And Well, that's a good thing for me. So if you're enjoying the podcast, please say so. And hey, if you're not enjoying it, I guess, say that too. I want you to be honest. Thanks for listening. We'll talk again. Mm -hmm.